Good morning, everyone. Today's message is Psalms 139, and it speaks to us about God's presence, God's purpose, and God's problems that we face together. And this message is a message that God wants you to hear, know, and live out. For it's foundational to our identity, our calling, our path, our purpose, and God's plan for our life. And when you take a hold of these foundational facts taught in Psalms 139, and, and they become who you believe and know you are, then you can start living fearlessly, living in joy, and living in all that God has made you to be. Now, who doesn't need more courage, more joy, and an understanding of who God made us to be? Now, some of us, some of you might be who are listening to this right now, might be a college student. Others, you may be in the middle of your career, entrenched in it. And then another group, you could be retired. But no matter what phase of life you're in, we all must continue asking, seeking, and following God to our next steps, our next path, our journey. Pastor Craig Bailey of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Charleston, South Carolina, recently challenged his whole congregation over the next few weeks to memorize Psalms 139 ESV. He wants the whole congregation to speak out loud together as one voice this scripture. And so why is this scripture above all others? Why did he choose this one? Why is it so vital? Well, I haven't asked him. I should have. Instead, I, I've read it 10 different ways, 10 different translations, and I've read it also re looking at definition for definition, Hebrew to English, trying to fully understand how valuable Psalms 139 is to our faith journey. And so I want to share some of this, this information that I found inside of these scriptures. I want to start first with the first verse. It says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. That's the ESV version. And that word known is more than just known in Hebrew. In the original language, it means to instruct, to advise, to reveal, to make known. In other words, Psalms 139 could be translated as, oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me and you advise me. So once you start realizing Psalms 139 is more than just talking about God observing you and examining you, it's also talking about how God advises you based on how God made you. And when you think about it from that point of view, it opens up doors to greater understanding about our relationship with God. In fact, the first part of Psalms 139 verses 1 through 12, to me, it's all about God's presence leading and advising you wherever you go. And even knowing all your faults, God knows all your faults. He knows everything about you. He still loves you, and he wants to be with you. He wants his presence to go with you wherever you go. And then the next set of verses, 13 through 18, teaches you that God made you for a preordained purpose and plan. And then the last set of verses, 19 to 24, encourages you to ask God to remove, remove or reveal the challenges that hinder God's plan and purpose for you. But remember, some of the problems that you have to go through help perfect God's perfect plan in you. So in essence, if you were to summarize it, it, it one uh, Psalms 139, it's God's presence, it's God's purpose, and it's God's problems that come into our life to help us be who God called us to be. So let's dive right into it. Psalms 139 using the ESV version. I'm going to just read it, you know, one through six, just start out with that. Oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and my acquainted, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. It cannot be obtained. So what does the scripture say so far to you about God's presence? Anything, any observation?
No thoughts yet? All right. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I, what I see there is he knows us even better than we know ourselves. Mm. He so knows true. our thoughts even before they come into our, our mind and understands us and still loves us. Yeah, yeah, and still <laughs> loves us. Yeah, I think that's that's the key. Yeah. And still and, wants and to we'll, advise us. And, and not only loves us, but he also wants to be with us. He wants to have fellowship with us. You know, it, I mean, I, I love some people that I really don't want to have fellowship with. <laughs> <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but God loves us in spite of ourselves and still wants to have fellowship with us. I think that's so key. Yeah. And if we can actually understand that and realize that, that will open so many doors for us emotionally, spiritually. Yeah. Any other thoughts? I like the part where he says we're wonderfully and magnificently made. Mm. It, it one of my dear friends, one of his favorite sayings is a song. It's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> uh, so I, I um, want to give you a little twist on it because everybody's heard it the way that I just read it. Most people would know that way, but. If you go through and read it through Hebrew, it gives you even greater understanding. That first, that O oh Lord is the, the word Yahweh, which is the actual name of God. It uses the personal name that, that God says. This is what it's so funny how uh, Americans are. It's like, uh, what's God's name? Well, it's God. No, it's, it's actually Yahweh, but we just don't say that. Or we'll say Jesus, you know. And, uh, but it begins with the personal name of God. Yeah, so think about it. it's the personal name. So he is the personal God. God knows and instructs me when I when I sit down, you know. So this first part it says, Oh, oh Lord, Yahweh, you search and investigate and know and advise me. You you know and instruct me when I sit down, when I rise up. I love this part. Yahweh discerns and understands and considers my feelings and gives me understanding to my thoughts i mean listen to that he he not so that, that verse means more than he just discerns that word discern means he understands he considers your feelings he gives understanding to your thoughts your purpose and plans afar that word far we're thinking he's far away from us no that word afar also means long ago so in other words god uses our past memories to give us understanding and he helps us when he's leading us. He considers our past experiences and our feelings as he leads us. That's what it's saying to us. And, and then the third verse says, he searches out my path and my lying down there acquainted with all my ways. Well, it's more than him just observing you. It's about him leading you. He searches out and examines closely and separates the good from the bad path. The... the um, Sorry, sorry, brother Don. I gotta mute you because I, I can hear the background noise while you're traveling. So, but I'll try to unmute you when, yeah, when the time comes. So, what it, what it um what it says is that Yahweh searches out and examines closely, and separates the good path from the bad path, from the, the path to rest and usefulness, for all of my way of my journey, my habits. And, and manners. So I'm going to read that again because I want to make sure you hear it. You search out my path, my lying down, and, my acquaint and you are acquainted with all my ways. Well, in Hebrew, it says he searches out and examines closely to separate the good from the bad path to rest and usefulness for all of my way, my journey, my manners, my habits. So there's so many things in our life that, that seem to be a hindrance, a problem, a challenge, and yet he's using that problem, that challenge, 
to, to perfect his purpose and will in our life. So all of the journey, all of the journey, he's separating the good from the path, bad path to help us in all of our journey, not just the present journey we're on, but all of our journey. He'll use the good and the bad to bring it all together. Next part, uh, verse four, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, oh God, you know, and remember that word know means also advise, you advise it all together. So even before I'm getting ready to speak, you're already speaking into me what I need to be speaking out of me. Whether I listen or not, that's a whole different thing, but it shows about the intimacy of God's presence with us. Next verse, you securely bind and surround me with your hand. That word hand is actually palm upon me. That's, it shows a, a, his blessing. God's, it's like he's saying, God's hand is upon me. I'm secure, entirely secure and surrounded by God's love and God's blessing. And this next verse I love, it's, uh, it's, it's, so, it's an oxymoron of words. It says, such ignorant, unaware knowledge. Ignorant, unaware knowledge is too comprehensible for me. It's too high. It's too inaccessible. In essence, our brains cannot ever fully comprehend how truly blessed and highly favored we are. Then it goes on in verses 7 through 12. It says, where sh shall I go from your spirit? Where should I go from your presence? Where should that word, actual word means God's breath. It's like God's air. Where can you go from the air? Where should you flee? Where can I flee from your presence? And that word presence right there, that Hebrew word for presence actually means God's face looking at you. It's like a father lovingly looking in, at you and protecting you. He's saying, where can I go from your loving presence? Where can I go from you looking at me and loving me? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which means the pits of hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and, the, and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there, your hand, which also means God's strength and power, shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. That word hold me actually means firmly grasped upon. He's not going to let you go. And then it goes on to say, if I say, this is just him saying it, surely the darkness, which literally means obscure, hidden, secret place, shall cover me, which actually literally means bruise me, overwhelm me, and break me, and the light about me be night. So even if this happens, here's what he says about God, even darkness is not dark to you, meaning even obscurity is not obscure to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Uh, real, not the real, but the Hebrew word, it says he makes, he illuminates the night. He is light itself. So, you know, darkness cannot exist because he is light itself. The next part, chapters 13 through 18 is about the fact that God made us for a purpose and a plan. So the first part is about God's presence. The next part is about God's purpose in your life. And the last part is, going about, is about God's problems and how we face them together. So this next part talks about the purpose and plan. You start in verse 13. For you, Scott, for me in my inner most parts. That's physical and emotional features. He formed your physical and emotional features. You knitted me. This is saying God knitted me together in my mother's womb. Tell us about the importance of even a child in the womb. Verse 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That means respectfully, honorably, and that word wonderful means uniquely made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you. That word, my frame, refers to the body's might, strength, and structure. Some even translate it as bones. But the way he builds you, it wasn't hidden from him. It was on purpose. And he goes on to say, when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths, that word depths means the lowest parts, the smallest parts of the earth. And that word earth means matter. So he's saying basically intricately woven DNA of who I am. Even that, you saw my 
unformed substance. This is the next verse. And in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Another word in translating it, and I, and I, I love it that it doesn't, in Hebrew, it doesn't say un, um, unformed substance. It says embryo fetus. You know, it, it's, it is the baby, you know, the, the two becoming as one. And it says, when I saw your embryo and fetus, my eye saw all, all, as the word, all the days that were engraved in my book was that were preordained and created for you to accomplish. God, when he saw you in the mother's womb, he automatically saw all the things that you were preordained and created for you, for you to do, for you to accomplish in his name and his strength and his power. He wove you together for that purpose. And then verse 17 says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. And that word God there is a different word for God. It, it means L. It's the word E-L, which means the most powerful ruler and judge. And it goes on to say, how vast is the sum of your thoughts for me? If I were to count them, they would be more than the sand. And then it goes on to say something that kind of like, this doesn't sound like it makes sense, but it says, I wake and I am still with you. So what does that really mean? So let's kind of, let's look back at verse 17. And, and it says about these thoughts that are so precious. What are those thoughts? And then that last verse, 18, I wake and you're still with me. Then it seems out of place. So what, is, what are those two verses trying to say to us? In the Hebrew, that word translated as thoughts, it has three meanings. The word thoughts in Hebrew is thoughts, purposes, and plans, or aim, or goals. So verses 17 through 18, if you were to translate it over from Hebrew to English, it says, how precious and valuable are to me God's thoughts, God's purpose, God's plan, and aim, and goals for me. How precious are those goals that you've already preordained and planned for me? Oh God, the supreme ruler and judge, if I were to count all the thoughts that you had placed in me about your purpose and your plan for me, they would be more than the sand. I await, that means I pay attention to God's thoughts, purposes, and plans that are inside me that are continuously with God and within me. That's what he talks about, I awake. So it's not just I awake and God, you're with me. It's I awake to the thoughts and purposes and plans that you have preordained and put inside of me. And just because God preordains a purpose and a plan, it doesn't mean that we don't have challenges that come along the way. And verses 19 through 24 remind us that problems, they come. They're part of God's purpose and plan in our life. They help perfect his plan. And when I read these next verses, okay, when we read these, I want you to remember it was written by King David. He's in a whole different situation than you and I. He, he, you know, when he talks about enemies, he's not talking about the guy at work that just doesn't like the way you talk or walk. King David is a warrior and a protector called by God to protect a nation. And the enemies he's talking about are not just people that don't like him. His enemies actually come to kill, steal, and destroy God's people. And the reality is, if you had an invader right now come into your house and try to kill your family, kill your children, your wife, kill you, you'd be saying these same exact words that David wrote down. So don't, don't judge him on this. But here's what it says. And this is about the challenges and problems that we face. Oh, God, would you slay the wicked? <laughs> and, and that word, oh, God, is remember, it's, it's, it's the ruler, the supreme ruler and judge. God, supreme ruler and judge, slay, kill the wicked. Kill those men of blood. Have them depart from me. For they speak against you with malice intent, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do, not, do I not hate those who hate you, oh, Lord? And now he's switching it to the personal name of God. So he's, he's going over here, don't I hate those who hate you? And he uses God's personal name. 
Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete, that means perfected hatred. <laughs> I hate them with complete perfection, you know, perfected hatred, meaning holy hatred, meaning godly hatred, meaning that it is uh, completely despised those who despise you, and I count them as my enemies. Now, remember this. Psalms is all about being honest with God and confessing how we feel. It's about getting the emotion out and letting God's spirit and truth in. Our emotional truth cries out to God, protect us from the wicked by killing them off. And remember, if someone was invading your house and it was either they kill you or you kill them, you want to you're going to be asking God to help me kill that person or, or God strike that person down. Yet the spiritual truth is this. If God removed all the wicked, then he would have to remove us too. For without God's grace through Jesus Christ, none of us are righteous. No, not one. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 10 of the New King James Version. And that is why we not only go to God to protect us from the wicked, but we also go to God so that God can protect us from the wickedness that is in us. And so Psalms 139 closes with the most popular verses of all of Psalm 139. It's, it's, it's 23 through 24. It says, search, which means investigate thoroughly. Oh, God, which means the supreme ruler and judge. You're the drudge. You're the ruler. So search me and know, which also means advise. My heart and that word heart there, the Hebrew word means mind, will, emotions, inclinations, my passions. So he's saying search and investigate and know and advise my heart. And the next verse, or no, it's still part of the same verse. So he's advise my heart. Then it says, try and examine me and know and advise my thoughts. So my heart, my thoughts. See and reveal if there's any grievous. That word grievous means wicked. Once again, he's, he's, you know, he said, remove the wicked. And now he's saying, remove the wickedness that's inside of me. Because even King David had heart invaders and thought invaders. That wicked thoughts and, and passions of the heart that he needed God to get out of them. And so it says, see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way to everlasting. So remember, God's presence, God's purpose, and God's problems are all part of God's adventure that God created you to live. So lots of information there. And I just want you guys to just share what, um, you know, what is it that, that God's speaking to you about what I just read about God's presence, God's purpose, and God's problems. Notice I call it God's problems because it's God who is the one that completely takes away the challenges, but he also uses those challenges to make us to who he's called us to be. Any thoughts, comments? Can you love your enemies and also at the same time want to kill them? <laughs> Yeah. Dwight? Yeah. I uh, I was just, you know, in, in verse 21, it says, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Or do I not love those who rise up against you? And, you know, I see it as, King, you know, David equating his enemies with God's enemies, not so much people that are coming against him, but people or things that are coming against God. You know, that, you know, it's not all Joe down the street that says something bad about me. It's Joe down the street that says something bad about God. Yeah, it's it's, and, it's the and, spiritual side of it. Yeah, you know, he he's he's defending God's righteousness, and 
and you know, and that. And now, you know, it's funny how the our pastor sermon this past Sunday was uh, in it. He talked about loving your enemies because you know, and, and I mean, um, and in that he was saying, you know, yes, in in Moses is that. Uh, yeah, they 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 said an eye for an eye, two for a tooth. You know, you know, you you, you know, we're seeking revenge, but Jesus gave us a better law, a better way to pray for your enemies, to bless your enemies, to feed them when they're hungry, to clothe them when they're naked. So it's a, but it, it's our enemies. Not so much God's enemy. God's enemies are the principalities and forces of evil that are around us that are just like we act out God's authority on earth. Other people, you know, if you're under the influence of a different spirit, you're going to act out that spirit's right. wishes. And so it it really is a, a a war of the heavenlies, not so much a war between people. That's a good point. A very, very good point. Yeah, because I, I, you know, as I read that, I was concerned that um, people are going to think, well, this is not biblical. You know, this is not. And, and I love the fact that even throughout Psalms, you'll see things that may feel not biblical you know, feel kind of con- counterintuitive with what Jesus taught, but uh, sometimes those in Psalms, it's it's about getting the emotion out so that the logic could come in. And the reality is, when you're emotionally upset with somebody, um, and and they are threatening your family and threatening you, you know, sometimes we feel like, hey, Lord, would you just get rid of that person? <laughs> you know, and oh yeah, and, you know, and and. Uh, uh, but then David then says, you know, get, he's saying get rid of the wicked. And then he says something that just totally is out. You know, it's kind of like it's just like King David. He'll talk about the emotional truth, but then he'll break back up with the spiritual truth. The spiritual truth he's saying is that I've got wickedness in me that I don't even know about. Right. And I need you, Lord, to help examine me and and and. And, you know, when you read it, you think it's like asking God to examine and know you, but he already examined and know, knows you. So really, to me, that that word know also means advise. And I really think that's what it's saying to us is that, Lord, search me and advise me. Advise me. And, and it's a big difference because there you you know, we've all been there when someone advises you and that advice is not solicited it's a whole different feeling than when you actually ask hey look um can you look at my business and help me figure out how i can do it better versus someone off the street who, who knows nothing about you knows nothing about what you do uh and it tries to tell you how to do your job better you know <laughs> And, and so it's so important that you see that he knows you. Not only does he know you, he made you. He, he made you both good and bad. Those, you know, when I say bad, I'm talking about some of the, you know, some of the flaws that we have in ourselves that we don't like. God put it there for a reason and a purpose, not because he hates us, not because he dislikes us, but, but because it's part of the per- path. It's part of the journey. So I, I think... So many times we look at our problems as, Lord, I just kill those problems, get rid of those problems. But those problems are part of the path. They're part of the journey. That's why I called this God's presence, God's purpose, and God's problems. Because ultimately, it's God's problems. You know, he, he put us in this path and he put, he wrote it in his book. It actually says engraved it. The things that are preordained that he, a purpose, thought, a plan that he has for us.
Now this this is being memorized in a Presbyterian church, which the the doctrine of predestination is one of the things that really sets Presbyterian apart from from others, um, other denominations. Um, but whether we like it or not, there are scriptures that say that he has preordained certain things in life. You know, uh, whether or not every Christian is the elect, uh, you know, whether everyone who's a Christian was, was chosen before the beginning of times or there's free will, that's, that to me is not something for, for none of us to, to even debate or, or in, and go through it. You know, it, I, I would not want to split a church over that. But, but what I do know is, is that um, God loves us and God chose us and God wants to be with us. And, and, um, and, and we just got to embrace that. His, I love that. No matter where you go, his presence is with you. Even if you try to get away from it, it's, it's, it's funny because if you really look at it, it's basically he's saying, if I try to run away from your presence, you're still there with me. And, and in that, as a parent, you, you fully understand that. You fully can comprehend that, that no matter where your child goes, you always want to be there to protect them and see over them. And which is really, really difficult as, as I entered the new phase of Anna being an adult you know, it's so hard for me. I want to just say, hey, look, you need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. And, 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 and instead of letting her make those decisions herself, you know, and so God does that with it. He's a parent, but yet at the same time, he, he knows that, that we, to get to where we need to be, we have to go through the challenges and problems that we face. So any other thoughts? Anything for my warrior friend, Darren? Uh, always something. Sorry, man. I've had a sick dog here this morning, so I'm kind of managing both. But um, uh, <clears throat> just thanks, man. I appreciate it. I, I just had a couple of thoughts. One, I think one time a minister challenged me. He said to me, Darren, you're too relationship driven. I wish I could go back in time and, and say to him, you're exactly right. And so is God. I mean, think about it for a moment. How, how much in error is that statement? God is always about relationships. As a matter yeah. of fact, if he wasn't, why did he ever create man to begin with? Right, right. So how, how erroneous are you to say something like that to me? I understand where you're coming from and that we should be God-driven, but God is always about relationships. Nothing else matters more to him. And what I love about David and reason Outside of my love for you guys here, the reason I joined this talk this morning is because if you talk about David, I am in. Let me <laughs> tell you what I love about David. Let me tell you what I love about him. Real. No fakeness, no phoniness, no saying the right thing in every moment. Honest, gut level, real. Yeah. If David wanted to kill you, you would know it because he would tell you. He wouldn't have a smile like at work. Everything's okay, and then go back and stab you in the back like most people do. If David had an issue with you, you're going to find out about it. Face-to-face, gut-level, real. And God loved him for it. Think about this. What is it about Psalms? You can break that verse down, every scripture down you want in Psalms. But let's be honest. Psalms is about a man named David and his love for God and everything that went on with it. And what I, I think the challenge for us brothers on this call, if I could uh, direct us in, a, in, a, in a, maybe a different direction, would be right out of the gate in that verse, he says, God knows me. Does God know you? We always talk about knowing God. Oh, do you know God? Uh, or do you know God? Remember how that got us in trouble? Jesus said it. Don't tell me you know God. Tell me God knows you. There's right. a difference. Does God know you? How honest are you really in your prayers? You just go through the motions. Remember what Jesus said about the pagan tax collectors? They babble, they babble, they babble in their prayers. But how honest are you? How honest are you really with God? That's something to think about. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that that, that haunting scripture in uh, Matthew, I, 
So Jesus says, depart from me. I never <laughs> knew you. Yeah. Because yeah, and I appreciate you pointing out God's name, Justin, but a lot of people know God's name. But does God know your name? Mm. Is your name written in the book? You know, I get on my kid about this. Well, I love my kid, and I, and I relate to Dustin about Anna. Mm. I have a 19-year-old, and he doesn't listen to anything I say anymore. I'd like to think he does, but he's heard everything there is to know on every subject from me. He doesn't really like my voice anymore, but I did show him something recently, and it's about opening the book. If you read about Ezra and Ezra, or you read about Ezra and Nehemiah, or you go back and look through the scriptures, you'll see that God refers to his word as a book, like the book. Read about Ezra, Ezra reading the law. Read about Josiah renewing the covenant. Read in Revelation 19 or so about the book. Is your name in the book? Is your name in the book? Don't tell me you know God's name. Is your name in the book? Does God know you? I just look at it like that because I think, guys, I think for me personally, this cuts through the crap. Stop babbling in your prayers, man, and get honest, get real, and, and watch. For me personally, in my life, man, my relationship with God grew like gangbusters when I started pouring it all out about how I really felt about everything. And with, with, the, with what you mentioned about the, about the enemies, let's just be honest, man. David was being very honest about that. Listen, these guys are about to kill me, God. They want to take my kingdom from me. This is a war era, Old Testament war era, an ancient people who only knew one thing. If you did not have the right defenses, somebody will come in and take your kingdom from you and put your head on a pole. That's how they did things back then. So David knew that. And David likes, he, yeah, he goes against his enemies. But when we are to love our enemies, that doesn't mean we don't have enemies because we do. And God does too. God has enemies. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, how he unpacks right there about the darkness. Our enemies are the darkness, fellas. And I think, something I haven't talked to you guys in a few weeks, but something I've been praying a lot about is I've been praying against the darkness because the darkness can be felt in this nation. I don't know where you guys are day in, day out. I don't know what you're paying, to, uh, paying attention to, but the darkness is, is strong and can be felt right now. That is your enemy. Your enemy is the darkness. Pray against it. I am. No. And that, um, it says the darkness covers. And that word covers means bruise, physically bruises you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with this, but there are times in my life where I am so stressed that I physically feel feel bruises on my body you know, when 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 i'm battling in my own strength and not in god's strength where it feels like darkness is overcoming me meaning that uh, you know the the life circumstances and challenges seem greater than my capacity to handle them and the challenges i'm handling them in my own strength um, i will actually feel pain in the neck or pain in the ass you know, and, uh, and, and that's where we get that expression, that person is a pain in the neck or pain in the, because it actually physically causes the feeling of a bruise. Um, so I, I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, that's what it says in the Hebrew. It, it isn't just darkness covers me. It's obscurity, this, the, the, um, you know, the hidden place and, and, the hidden place for many of us are our addictions. It's our, our shame. It's, um, you know, that shame wants to beat you up. Shame wants to, and that's what that word obscurity, something hidden, that something you think is hidden from God. It wants to beat you up. It wants to control you. It wants to rule over you. It wants you to think that, that the day is now dark, you know. And so, yeah, you're right, Darren, we need to shine the light because if we don't shine the light into the darkness, darkness will overcome. Yeah. Boy, in Jesus' name, man, that covering dust, man, I jo I'll join in with you brothers on this, but we already know that, and it's important to say on record, because if you look at, if you look in the media right now or on social media or even in your culture, it may look to you or to me 
like darkness is winning. It's not. It's not winning. They're already defeated. It may look like it to those who the kingdom, who their kingdom is this in, in this world. It might look like they're winning, but they've already lost. Going back to the time of Genesis three, Satan's head has already been crushed. Paul says the same thing in Romans. Satan's head has been crushed. It might look like darkness is winning in the culture war, but it's not. It's not winning, and the darkness has no power if you command it in God's name in Jesus' name. It has no power. You can push back back the darkness. Remember every time Jesus encountered the darkness uh, by whether the demon possessed man or other count, uh, the demons would shriek. They would come and they would fall before Jesus and they would beg him. In other words, they had no power against our Lord. And I think as brothers in God and brothers in, in Christ, we have to speak in the authority that God has given us and push back the darkness. You got to push it back. Now, listen, if you don't take a stand and you don't pray against it and you don't fight it, it will continue to advance. But you got to push it back. But it's important for me. I think I share it with you, brothers, because it's been heavy on my heart that it's easy to think that Satan is winning. But we know different. I always thought that was kind of funny, man. Years ago, I heard uh, like a comedian talk about, why would you be a Satan? I mean, the Bible, always, the Bible already tells you you've lost because there's a, there is a lie, right? There's a lie that this kingdom of this world is going to win, but it's not. As a matter of fact, if you read Second Peter, you realize that what you see happening is exactly as God is allowing it to. It's going to wind down. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. It will continue to get worse. It's biblical. Then God sets up a new order, right? We know that. But it's easy to forget that. I was going to tell you one, one tidbit about the darkness here. Back uh, in the time of Exodus and God's people, during the plagues, there was a plague of darkness. You guys may know it and you may remember it. But there's a choice of language that's very, very interesting because the God, God's people were in the light. There was a plague of darkness that fell upon God's enemies. And the writer of Exodus, this would be Moses, uh, and Genesis, um, excuse me, Moses, it says that it was darkness that could be felt. That's how deep the darkness is. It can be felt. But God's people, always in the light. Hey, one thing, Dustin, man, you know, I ain't talked in a while, so you got to bear with me. But I was walking <laughs> through the woods the other day. I was walking through the woods the other day, man, and uh, with my dogs, and I caught in my left peripheral vision, I caught a, I saw a snake, right? And it kind of, it kind of, it kind of, uh, you know, it got my attention. So I saw it kind of scurry off. But no matter how scary a snake is, realize that a snake really only has one defense. It either, it, it will run, or, or, or bite. But if you get past its head, it can do nothing. And God tells us that. That's exactly what God tells us. That the the serpent's head is crushed. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It's defeated. And I think it's important. If you haven't seen a snake lately, you'll realize they're kind of scary, but they hide, and they hide because they realize how easy they are to defeat. And no matter what culture looks like right now, they're not hard to defeat. Not in God. Not in God. Stand on the promises. That's what I'm doing. Stand on the promises that Satan's head has been crushed. And with David, he uses that language. Uh, and a couple other songs, uh, Dust, you may have seen it. He talks about crushing the head of his enemies. He uses yeah. that language. Crush the head of the darkness, guys. Listen, power in unity, power in prayer. Uh, if you guys want to join me in that prayer, join in, because that's what I've been praying here lately. So just uh, kind of catch you up what's, what's been on my mind already here lately. But I think the darkness itself needs to be checked. Check it. Check it with the power that God gives us and watch it retreat because it really has no power at all. I think it's just heavy on my heart because I'm kind of sick and tired of watching the darkness thinking it can do what it wants when it can't. I love it. I love what you're speaking, man. And, you know, I, the name Darren, you know, if you, you look it up, it means great or it means gift, but to me, I also think of the word dare, like you dare someone to do something. And, and so I, 
uh, I just hear your heart, man. It's like, yeah, I call you my warrior friend because, you know, it's like, it's like you, like you dare Satan. You, you, you dare you try to take our nation. How dare you? So I, I love it, man. But you're right. You're right. We as a believer, as a body, um, prayer is our, our greatest weapon. And, um, and, and then to be listening to the thoughts, uh, as, as David said, Lord, know my heart. But remember, it also means advise. Lord, advise my heart. Advise my thoughts. And so he's always speaking to us. The question is, are we listening? And, uh, you know, I, I, I love that scripture where um, in Ezekiel about the dry bones, where, where God tells Ezekiel to speak to those dry bones. And, and the reality of life is there are things that God has asked you to speak to that are impossible in your own power to do, uh, but it isn't your power. It's his power. And so it's kind of like, um, for some reason, I vision this kid, uh, you know, uh, pressing a button, but it's really his dad who's actually making it happen. You know, all the kid has to do is press the button and, and his dad is the, actually the one who's really making it happen. And so that's the way God does it for us. There are things he has asked us to do that are impossible for us to accomplish on our own but he's asked us to do it uh, so that we can see him working through it. And so if he's asking you to speak out about the injustice in this nation, about the darkness in this nation, and, and you're thinking, it's just me, I can't do anything, uh, don't have that attitude. If he asks you to speak it out, you speak it out. You live it out. You speak to the darkness and tell it to flee. Well, I don't have the power and authority to do that. No, you do. You know, you, you don't, but God does, but if God is, if God has put it on your heart, because that's who he designed you to be before. I love that before you were ever, ever, ever born before you ever walked on this earth, when you were inside your mother's womb, he had already had seen what he had engraved in his book. Not only is your name in the book, but he has engraved what you are called to do. I love that. Love it. That's why I think that whole scripture isn't about him just examining you. It's, it's about him advising you, you know, and so to crush the head of the enemy. Any other thoughts, you guys? All right, I'm going to hit stop on the recording.